What if we've been thinking about the path to financial well-being all wrong? What if the path really begins with your physical and mental well-being? Let's dig into this on today's episode of the Banking on Digital Growth podcast. You're listening to the Banking on Digital Growth podcast. Welcome to the Banking on Digital Growth podcast. I'm Audrey Kanata, Operations Lead here at the Digital Growth Institute. And today we will explore the idea that mastering your body can lead to mastering your mind and ultimately mastering our finances. We'll also dive into the concept of digital stoicism and discuss practical practical tips for managing our relationship with technology in a way that promotes well-being. And joining us for today's conversation is founder and CEO of the Digital Growth Institute, James Robert Lay. Hey, Audrey. Hey, James Robert. How's it going? It is uh, It is a good day. As of recording, we are almost up to the peak of Mount Mutatio that I wrote about in Banking on Change. It is the end of June, about to go into July. It's my favorite time of the year to be... A- it is. It's we're able to review and reflect of where we've been. Look, you know, on the back half of the mountain, we're able to look down to see where we're at right now. But what gets me most excited is to be able to look ahead at to where are the opportunities going forward. Yeah, it really is. I love, I love this changing of the season as well. And speaking of changing of the seasons, you have been doing quite a bit of personal reflection lately. Uh, especially via LinkedIn. You've been sharing a lot of your experiences and I know several of them got quite a bit of just really great feedback. And, and I know it took kind of a lot from you to be able to really share some some sides that you haven't been so public with before. And so I want to take a look at those today um, and and really talk about how you have been able to take this idea of mental well-being and physical well-being and even spiritual well-being um, and how that plays into our overall financial well-being. Very much so. And when we look at the idea of creating space and to your point, seasons, it is important to create space and time to pause, to review, to reflect. Uh, It was Socrates who said the unexamined life is not worth living. And yep. Delina and I, my wife, we were out on a walk and I asked her, I said, how many people do you think go through life and they just really never take time to review and reflect and they just keep doing what they have always done, keep thinking what they have always thought. And I I really do work to create that space as an individual, uh, as a leader. Um, I, I, I enjoy that space that we do here as a company. Um, so that we can all review, reflect, and just gain perspective. Um, because it does beg the question of what if we have been thinking about uh, this idea of financial well-being all wrong? Because yeah. here we are in 2024, and the numbers show that financial well-being is actually getting even worse, even though right. the 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 investment, if you will, into financial literacy and financial education has increased over the last decade or so. We're 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 not trending in a positive pattern right now. Yeah, and I love I love your post you had the other day where you opened it up with what if we've been thinking about the path to financial well being all wrong? And I think for many of us, we begin with our financial well being, meaning. Mm-hmm. We believe that when our finances are in order, when we have what we want financially, that will lead to greater mental well-being. That'll lead to better, you know, greater happiness, greater satisfaction. But it has to start there when with some of the readings that we've been doing and the conversations we've been having, that might be the last step if we're thinking about all of the different stages of well-being. Well, you're, you're right. There's five stages or five levels of what I frame as wealth and well-being, and they're all interconnected. Um, when you look at the, these five levels, it's spiritual wealth or spiritual well-being that then moves into physical wealth and well-being, which moves into the mental wealth and well-being, and that then translates into wealth, relational wealth and well-being. And then finally, at the, 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 the bottom, if, if you will, it's, it's the financial wealth and well-being. But I'll be the very first one to admit I have sacrificed 
all four other levels to just focus on the financial piece at yep. the expense of the all four other levels and actually ended up in a far worse place than what I was even to begin with. And yep. so there's a matter of reframing here that because the definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over and over again and expect a different result. And then when we're looking at like 80, 85% of people struggling with financial stress or financial anxiety, what, instead of trying to transform the wallets of people or their accounts, what if as financial brands, we take a different approach and we help them transform their physical well-being, we help transform their mental well-being, and then as a direct result of that, they will transform their financial well-being. Yeah, and it's actually really great timing because I saw on LinkedIn this morning, Daniel White had a post mm. and he said, um, inner contentment and peace of mind aren't just feel-good emotions, they're foundational to building a secure and prosperous life. And so I think, you know, many people probably have been in your situation where financially, James Robert, what was that, a decade ago, you know, 12 years ago, you were killing it. Your business was thriving. Yeah. Um, but like you said, you were not in a good place. In fact, you risk losing the most important people in your life. Yeah. A lot of it, so well, a, a lot of it was my priorities were out of line i was i was chasing something that i thought would make me happy yep but in reality what i was chasing brought more pain not just to myself but to the people around me whether that was the team at the office and and you were there you 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 saw that experience at the time but even more closer to home in the home it was it was a very young family uh, my wife and I, we had two kids at the time. And in hindsight, in retrospect, sometimes, and, and, and I, I don't, I don't regret any of it. Right. Because. Made you who you are today. E exactly. And if we think about like financial situations, um, how much do we attach a negative emotion, regret, even worse, shame, guilt? to a situation or to an experience that we end up just keep repeating the same behavior over and over and over again because we we perceive we feel we do not have a path or a way out yeah. and, and maybe the path of the way out isn't what we think it is what if we look at the other aspects of wealth and well-being yeah. as a multiplier the spiritual yeah the physical, the mental, the relational. Yeah. And that's something that you did. I mean, I, you had to really take time and, and think about your mental, physical, emotional, spiritual well-being. And, and to back it up a little bit, you, you made uh, the comment that, you know, financial education and information mm. is, you know, more prevalent than ever at our fingertips. But yet the numbers are telling us that there is just as much, if not more financial stress today than ever. Um, and so I think that leads to the, the hard truth that maybe financial education uh, and knowledge alone isn't enough to transform behavior. And so that's kind of where these conversations are coming in. So what do we do? We want to transform the wallet. We want to transform our uh, financial well-being. We have to back up. But I feel, though, and especially in this industry, that might be a tough concept to grasp, not because of an unwillingness, but just it's unfamiliar territory. It's a little uncomfortable. We're talking numbers, figures, data. Now we're talking about feelings and emotions. Mm. It is uncomfortable, and it is a different perspective. Um a lot of my perspective has transformed really over the last decade from what I have read. Uh, and what I have read, it's been a wide variety of works. Many published a hundred 
plus years ago, if not even going back into the Stoic philosophy. Yeah. And what that has done is helped me see things from a different perspective. It's helped me think about things differently. And we know that seeing and thinking are the first two steps that lead to human transformation. Over and over and over again, and you, you have been a participant in this, you have seen when I ask, okay, well, when you see different and you think different, well, what's the next logical step that someone's going to take? Yeah. And, it, and it was funny because yesterday uh, in a call <laughs> we were having, I said, well, 98% yeah. of people. And you said, no, no, no. <laughs> you said 99%. no. Yeah. I just really wanted to make the point that this is, this is what we hear. And it's because the, it's the logic, it's the logical mind here saying to, well, of course, James Robert, it's a rhetorical question. And I'm a bit insulted that you asked me this. Of course, when I see different, I think different, of course, I'm going to act different, be different or do different. And I go, that's super interesting. Because right now, and if you're watching or listening to this, I challenge you, do you have intellectual intellectual knowledge, a logical perspective that there are things in your life, regardless of what those things are, that you need to do, take a different path, a different course. You need to make a change, but you're failing to do so. Because yep. I'll be the first one to admit, I'm always yep. working on this myself. Yeah. Yeah, 1000% I have been there knowing what I need to do, but I don't do it. And and it took me, and we talked about this before, getting a financial coach because I had to figure out what was going on inside of me. What, where were these beliefs mm. and feelings? What were the issues that I was dealing with that was standing in my way? What was my roadblock? Like, I, and I think for a lot of us, logic is safe. I know it is for me. Uh, I was always a, a math fan growing up because I knew that there was a formula to get the answer. You do X, Y, and Z, and you get the results that you want. Uh, but there's, but you know, the world and, and our minds are just so much more complex than that. And there's all these other factors that we have to think about. Yeah, and it's it's the it's the uncomfortable piece of feeling. Neville Goddard wrote a book, probably maybe 50, 60, 70 years ago called feeling is the secret. And when you think about what bridges the gap between thought and action, it is feeling. It is emotion. It's not logic because the desire, the feeling, the emotion to do different, to be different, to act different has to be greater, sometimes exponentially greater than the desire, the feeling, the emotion to stay the same. We see that through the work that we do, through the coaching that we do, guiding financial brands through the Banking on Digital Growth program. But as I was going through writing Banking on Change, it became very, very clear that the methodologies we teach around human transformation can easily be applied externally for financial brands to help their account holders make a positive transformation in their financial life. And I do want to address some of the, the data. Because I know who watches, I know who listens to this podcast. And the data does not lie. Market Watch recently released a report. And there are some some key points. And I want to start on the first one. And maybe maybe what we can do is break one of each one of these up. Because we are addressing feeling, we are addressing emotions. 88% of people feel some level of financial stress. It's feeling it's an emotion. How do you, how do you quantify that? I think that's a, it's a great point. How do you quantify a feeling or an emotion? So when you think about your account holders, how do you quantify their feelings and emotions? More specifically, if according to the market watch report, 88% of people feel some level of financial stress, how many of those people work within your financial brand? Mm -hmm. Because the more, the, the, the more, the, The damning number, I guess, is 65% say finances are their biggest source of stress. That's a, that's a, that's a huge, that's, that's, that's six out of 10 people pushing seven out of 10 people 
say that the biggest source of stress in their life is finances. And do you think it's because people think that their biggest source of success and satisfaction are their finances as well? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, if I, if I look back at the 2012 narrative, I thought that I was going to find like this ultimate happiness once I had the promised land. Yeah. Like had X number in the bank, but it's like, once you get X number of the bank, then you want to get to the next X number in the bank. And then the next and the next and the next that never ending goalpost mo- getting moved. Exactly. And that gap, that's where you start griping about problems and, and you forget what to be grateful for yeah. the, the other gifts, if you will, in life. And as I mentioned, you have these five dimensions or five levels of wealth and well-being and the market watch report hits on this on, on another one we talked about relational wealth and, and well-being 58 percent of people admit to hiding financial stress from loved ones 44 percent said that they're going to ignore a financial problem until it becomes a crisis and then there's the the physical aspect 47 percent say 2024 has been the most stressful year of their life financially. 94% say they sacrificed their mental health to get by financially. 92% say financial stress has caused adverse physical effects. And that's where I think the connection between the mind, body, and the wallet all begin to intercollide. 41% from the Market Watch report say finances have destroyed their mental health. But let's go back. 92% say financial stress has caused adverse physical effects. Yeah. It's so it's so interesting to me because just the way these are connected, if you begin with the physical or I'm sorry, if you begin with the financial well-being as that is the priority, the top the risk that you're undertaking by focusing on that and you know you're essentially you're willing to to risk your mental well-being mm-hmm. your physical i mean the physical ailments caused by stress i i just feel like it's recipe for just disaster then if you take a step away and i'm not saying and, and i don't want this to sound insensitive to anyone who's dealing with financial stress because i you know i've shared this before i have been there 100% where the, my financial stress, it almost took me out. Um, I mean, you saw it on me, but, and it would have kept happening yeah. had I not reached out for help and asked for a financial coach and gotten the mental clarity and the emotional strength to tackle it and flip the narrative. But at the same time, if I think about your journey, Almost in parallel, you begin to focus on not just financial well-being, but right alongside that, you are focusing on your physical well-being, which then had a direct correlation to your mental well-being. Which then comes full circle and helps me improve my financial well-being because I'm in the correct mindset mindset to do so. Correct. And- This is my theory, and it is a theory, but it's one that I want to continuously test with the financial brands that we are coaching and guiding in the Banking on Digital Growth program, where you transform your body to transform your mind. Put it another way, you master your body to master your mind. See, that's a a stoic philosophy. It's not my idea. That's a philosophy that has withstood the test of time for thousands of years. Master the body to master the mind. Master the mind now to master your money because of the emotive aspect of money. And so when you look at the connection and the correlation between the mind, the body, and money. I do believe there's an opportunity to integrate 
those three aspects from a marketing, from a sales, from a service perspective within a financial brand that looks at the holistic picture. And maybe, I mean, even, even when we think about like the physical, because what we're, what we've really, what we've really looked at is the, the mental, the mind and the money connection, but let's, let's look at what's going on right now physically too, you know, in, in physical challenges. It's not, you know, it's not a popular subject to, to address, but you got to start addressing this stuff. 70% of Americans are either overweight or obese. And I'm curious, and I don't have the data, but where does that intersect with a person's financial well-being and their mental well-being? Because there is data that shows obesity is having a negative impact on mental well-being. I got, I, you know, I, I, once again, I don't have the data, but the hunch, the gut, the feeling, the emotion that I have says, you know what? There's probably a connection and a correlation between a person's physical wellness, even their weight, tied back to their financial well-being. Not a popular subject to to, to address. But here's no. the thing, if we don't address if we do not address this, if we do not start having these conversations, the future becomes the predictable past based, based upon how we're thinking and feeling in the present moment right now. I agree. And and I think that there is a connection when your mental health is suffering, when your financial health is suffering, you're going to take it out on your body mm. with even if you're not not intentionally but if you think about how do we cope how what are our, our what are our most unhealthy coping habits indulging mm. on food alcohol yeah any other thing that's a, an instant feel good to escape um the current moment yeah. that's what we tend to default to um, probably all of us are guilty either now or at one time in our life. And I know you, well, we both talked about this before, um, is really reexamining our relationship with alcohol and how we are using it and, you know, how we're, uh, interacting with it. Uh, now you, you've killed it compared to me. No, but it's, it's a matter of this is the journey and I have no judgment towards anyone. And that's what I Mm -hmm. guess, I guess that's one of the reasons like I am starting to speak up now on just my own, my own personal narrative, because that's, that's all I can share. That's all that I have experienced, but I am one who has dealt with depression, addiction, autoimmune conditions, that have taken a negative toll on my physical well-being, which then took a toll on my mental well-being, which then took a negative toll on my financial well-being. But it's almost like I I said, you know what? I got to master my body, particularly when it came to my autoimmune condition with the ankylosing spondylitis that I was diagnosed with in January of 2010. Mm-hmm. Never talked about it. Did I even, did I even share that back in the day? I don't, I can't even remember. Did I even share any of that with y'all? Uh, you did, but it was very like high level, not a big deal. I, I and I only remember that cause I had to Google it mm. and I couldn't spell it <laughs> correctly. Um, but you did give us a little bit, but we couldn't, you didn't like wear it on you. I mean, it wasn't obvious. It wasn't, I didn't know how big of a deal it was or not, but you were also at that time, James Robert, you know, our working relationship was far and I mean, not even close to what it is now. Um, sure. I mean, you were kind of, you were in and out, you were in the office and then when you were in there, you know, head down 90% of the time and then you were out. Um, so I didn't have a lot of this backstory or what was really going on no one behind knew. Yeah. No one, no one knew. I, I carried this all alone. I didn't want to share it with anyone. I wanted to hide it. I, I just, because I thought that if people knew that I had an autoimmune condition, people would think that I was weak. 
people would yeah. think that uh, he's his, he's done. Yeah. And that was the lie that I told myself. And once again, this is the physical, mental, monetary, financial connection here. And what I ended up doing, and, and I think to a degree, the financial piece, because we were going through rapid growth at that time as well. Oh, yeah. It was a mask. And, but at the end of the day, all the truth is going to come out. You know, if we try to hide something, and, and we know even from an autoimmune perspective, autoimmune issues tend to be some type of mental trauma stress that is become a physical manifestation. And yeah. I've had to do a lot of work on the mental side of things as well. But I did make a decision after I went through some real bad depression and addiction issues that I got to master, I got to master my body because I was either this autoimmune condition, the ankylosing spondylitis was going to define what my life was, or I was going to say, you know what? I'm going to define what this is. Yeah. Yeah. And that's chose, what the Stoics say. Master your body first. And chose to write a, just a different narrative. And so never ran a marathon, never really even ran before outside of, you know, athletics and school, playing sports. Started started running, training for a half marathon, ran a couple full marathons. And that is where if someone is listening, thinking that, oh, well, I'm, they might not be in the best physical shape right now. I just want you to know that that's okay. It's one yes. step at a time. That's, that's why and there it, is couch to 5K. It's not couch to marathon. Right. right. And, and it's never too late either. No, it, it's it really not. is. And I think, and I think that is one of those weird, um, uh, misperceptions or whatever, whatever you want to call it that we have with age that like, I don't know, I, I did, you know, a, when I turned 30 and, and shortly after I definitely went through that old, oh man, 30, like downhill, wah, wah. But I'll tell you what, I absolutely love my age and where I'm at. And I can tell you with a hundred percent, a hundred percent confidence, I'm going to be better in 10 years from now. I think I'm going to love my forties more than I love my thirties. Um, and I think that's just the, the, the choice that I've decided to go into it. I'm not going downhill. Yeah. And here's the thing, uh, <laughs> like, cause I mean, I'm, I'm 43 working towards 50 and I've got this, you know, 50 fit as F, uh, <laughs> goal for, of my own Yeah, because I I'm viewing this as a lifelong journey. Not every day is great. Come back to the idea of, of indulgence. Like when we're down, when we're depressed, where do we turn? Food, alcohol. Well, I've, I've removed the alcohol from my life because I would say that I, I in, in hindsight, and a lot of reflection, I did have a dependency on it. Yeah, same. And I, I, it was not allowing me to be the better version of my future self. And I saw that my future self would not thank me for the decisions I was making in the present. See, there's a lot of truth to that with finances. Yeah. Whether we're talking future self from a physical aspect and physical well-being or future self from a financial well-being. Because in the day-to-day -day grind, getting up, walking, running, lifting, rowing, cycling, jiu-jitsu, whatever the physical activity is, in the day-to-day -day grind, it doesn't feel like you're making any progress. The same is true when it comes to watching your financial behaviors. Yep. Spending versus saving versus investing. All three of those elements. Because you're it's the delayed gratification to a point. It is. But you're also then able to measure the progress looking backwards. And I think for me... Like that 2012 was just such a strong, dark night of the soul, 
deep valley that I can continue to look back and say, my goodness. And some days I have peaks, some days I have valleys, but it's always looking back. I heard someone tell me one time, sometimes you got to have a breakdown before you get a breakthrough. Let me tell yeah. you, since 2012, I've had a lot of breakdowns since then as well. Like life has not been peachy rosy every step of the way. No, you know, I find fascinating James Robert. I just put this together. I think our, our dark night of the soul moments were like exactly a decade apart. That's wow. It really, really. If I, and I think back at the, like the year. Absolutely. Wow. That's super fascinating. And, and, and but, but it's been, and I'm so grateful that I've, that I've been here, that I was here during that time because I've been able to, I mean, so many of the lessons, like as we're talking about these things on the podcast, this is all real time. Like these are all current lessons that I'm learning and applying right now that, and I'm still struggling with, mm -hmm. and I still have really crappy days and really terrible decisions that I make, but it's just this ongoing conversation that if I wasn't in this environment, I, I don't know where I'd be right now. I really don't. Well, a lot of that is you're, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And that's one of the reasons like I have continuously invested in entrepreneurial coaching programs to be around other entrepreneurial leaders that are going through similar struggles and trials and tribulations, but it's the hero's journey, right? And like my experience, I'm hoping has had a positive impact on you through your dark night of the soul moment. Your dark night of the soul moment, though, I'm I'm starting to observe is having a positive impact on other people. And, and this is the greater, I mean, there's there's definitely, a, you know, if we come back to the, you know, five dimensions of wealth and well-being, you've got the spiritual, you've got the mental, or you got the physical, you got the mental, you got the relational, you got the finding. They're all, once again, they're all interwoven. They're all interconnected. Like this energetic ripple effect. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it was funny because when I was doing a book signing a couple of weeks ago uh, after a, a keynote, someone asked me about the butterfly on the cover of Banking on Change. Mm -hmm. And I told them, they're like, oh, it's, does, does that represent the butterfly effect? I go, no, but that's a fantastic observation. And I said, it, you know, the butterfly represents transformation because you, you go from the caterpillar to the cocoon from the cocoon to the butterfly. But when the butterfly flaps, it swings. That's when the butterfly effect happens. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm hope that those watching and listening, you know, we've at least flapped our wings once today and have made a ripple effect for one of you, um, yeah. that you can take some of this thinking back and where is the opportunity that connects the financial, the physical, the mental all together because yeah. it all is it's interconnected. Great. It is. And and this is actually just a really great way to wrap this conversation up uh, with that note. Where Where is the opportunity? Where is the opportunity to pull all of these dimensions of well-being together for ourselves, for our organization, for our community? Here's, if you're not actively moving right now, meaning you're not, you don't have some type of physical element in your life. And I'm not telling you to go out and run and, you know, do an Iron Man or a Tough Mudder or anything crazy. All I'm asking you to do is just go for a walk. Get moving. Physically get moving. If you feel stuck in your life, move. Walk. Like I was on a mastermind group this morning for an hour and I walked three or four miles during that time period. And I'm in that there's a, and I wrote about this in banking on change. You can hack time when you mm -hmm. combine movement and physical activity yes. with, it. with learning Yep. because you're taking care of your body, but you're also leveling up your mind and your perspective. And you will learn and absorb that knowledge better. I'll tell you, because as your physical activity, you are increasing, um, uh, and what's it? Not, not dopamine. Sarah, what is it? Ser I don't know. 
serotonin, the feel good. And when you have those going, when you have those, that, that feel good, uh, those feel good chemicals going as you're learning, you're going to absorb it and remember it that much more. I think about, uh, Jeffrey Kendall, uh, CEO over at Nimbus, he had posted something recently on LinkedIn to where as a leadership team, when they're together, because they have a lot of remote work as well, but they go for these walk and talks. Oh. So they'll physically have a meeting walking and that transforms the dynamics. And so if you are feeling stuck in life as a leader, as a team, Integrating physical movement and physical activity will help you unlock and break free from whatever the anchor is. Yeah. Most importantly, it's going to create some momentum. The physical, the mental, the monetary, it's all interconnected. But back to the point of the physical movement and physical activity. No one said they regretted a workout ever. I'll be the very first one to admit there are some days that I do not want to get up and work out. I do not want to get up and move. Particularly when I'm living with an autoimmune condition that creates physical pain. But let me tell you, I master the body, I master the mind, and my mood and my level the natural result of that is an increase. And so we all get to make a choice every single day of how we're going to move. Are we going to stay stuck in the cave of complacency? Or are we going to have the courage and be disciplined to do the difficult things and keep moving forward? And sometimes it's just much easier to keep moving forward together, which is where I appreciate our collaboration because physical health, physical well-being is so critically important here physical health leads to the mental health and the mental well-being and that is then you know continuously helping to increase improve and increase financial well-being they're all interconnected absolutely on that note i'm going to bring my yoga mat next time i'm in the office <laughs> i love it we'll do it we'll definitely we'll do it we'll do yeah. a yoga do session pose while we're strategizing i i love it um <laughs> you know i actually prefer the downward dog because okay. of, with the ankylosing spondylitis and yeah. the back, it really yeah. does, it really does release the back. And I, I, we used to have a, a Bikram yoga close by, uh, the yeah. hot yoga that I could pop into. Absolutely amazing. Uh, walking in yeah. there, I don't want to do it. Walking out, I'm like, I'm so glad I did. Oh yeah, it's rough. It's rough to get used to it. Your body adapts, which is another lesson for another day. Um, James Robert, this has been great. I've loved this conversation with you today. It has been. It has been great. It's been a lot of fun. And thanks for facilitating. Absolutely. And thank you, listeners, for joining us for another episode of the Banking on Digital Growth Podcast.